Um, we all know Les as the director of the BDI, the Biodiversity and Development Institute. And um, uh, sometimes I think of Les as the, uh, as, as the person who, who keeps watch over how things are going. And uh, this, evening, this evening's presentation is, is no different. Um, Les will be talking to us about, uh, about the um, uh, Odonata map, the uh, virtual museum project looking at, at mapping of Odonata in Africa. And uh, he will be looking not only at, um, at progress, but also he's, uh, he'll, he'll make some suggestions for what we should be doing uh, in the upcoming season, uh, when it's warmer down here in the southern part of Africa, uh, on the Odonata map project. Les, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, um, Rick. Thanks very much. Um, so this is a presentation on the Odonata map project. Um, yeah, it's just the, uh, the raw numbers from the, uh, the statistician. In the... Um, in the, the uh, Odonata year, which runs from um, July to June. And in Cape Town, there's no chance of uh, seeing much um, dragonfly activity at present, but there are still records being submitted from, um, from farther north. So uh, this is quite a sort of an artificial break in the year, but it's a break that makes, uh, makes sense. So 19,000, 19,000, 20,000, 18,000 for the past four years. That's remarkably uh, stable um, after the, the big step up um, four years back. So each of these past few years has been a bit of a challenge. Summer rains coming late throughout the pandemic. So um, sustaining these stable totals over the past four years has been... Uh, an amazing achievement by a team with an automap. I emphasize that the project is, uh, is African in scope, but um, the, um, the, the JRS project that we're dealing with at present has, um, has made us focus more on the South than what perhaps we would have liked to have done. So during the past year, records from 18 African countries and the, uh, the totals are there. And everything that's done in this uh, presentation could also be done anywhere else on the, um, on the continent. So <clears throat> the, um, the theme of, of uh, this evening's presentation is uh, up to dateness. So when we've done an atlas in the past, we've, um, we, we've held the view that once a species is recorded in a grid cell, grid cell, we don't really need to record it again. But, um, but as the, this dragonfly atlas is running, um, the same was true of the butterfly atlas and the reptile atlas, frog atlas, the data collection goes back to the, uh, the start of museum collections. And um, it's a bit difficult to justify a, um, a record made in 1951 or 1901 as, um, as an up-to-date record of the, um, the occurrence of the species in the area. So what could happen if we decided that we'd only use um, records from the past five years or the past 10 years in our um, atlas maps? Then um, the, the issue of, of refreshing old records becomes um, really um, important. So, um, you know, ideally, we'd like to record every species in each grid cell every year, but that's a, um, a bit of a pipe dream. So, um, so the, the statistician asks, how do we measure up-to-dateness? How can we tell if one biodiversity database is more up-to-date than, um, than another one? How do we put a number to it? So I chose a, um, a grid cell which uh, didn't have too many species. It's on the uh, border between uh, South Africa and Botswana. Um, so that's a quarter degree grid cell, 15 minutes by 15 minutes, about uh, 27 kilometers uh, square. 
here's the uh, the list of species and um, and the important thing I want you to look at is the, um, the second last column which says when the species was last recorded so the fourth species down acacia sprite has been recorded four times and the most recent record is the 16th of March 2011 and if you click on records at the right hand end then you get those um, four records um, displayed. Now even though it says um, number of species there the eighth one down has only been identified to um, genus and so there are four of those which have been id to genus so there isn't actually 24 species there's only 20 species for uh, for this grid cell so uh, this is a particular problem for um, odonata map because many records can't be identified to, um, to species. So this, this problem is, uh, occurs more in Odonata map than, uh, than elsewhere. So here's the, uh, the bottom right-hand corner of that um, previous table again. 24 lines in the table, but four are not identified to species level, so they're just 20 species. So take the last recorded date for the 20 species. So this is what, what actually is done. It ignores the ones which aren't identified to species. Sort them from um, the oldest to the newest. Um, and the date on top, the one with one asterisk is the date in the middle, the median date of the 20 species. So half of those species have been recorded before the 14th of March, 2019, and half of them since the um, 14th of March. So um, statisticians like medians when there are um, outliers in the data set. So if there were observations from uh, say 1905, then they would drag a, a mean down, but they don't have any impact on the median because the median is just the middle number. So um, I'm defining the up-to-dateness of the grid cell is the 14th of March 2019 and the uh, I, I shouldn't have chosen a grid cell in which both dates were the same but by chance I, um, I did and I was too far into the preparation to actually go back and start all over again so there's a total of 47 records and, um, and with the two stars uh, their median date is also the 14th of March 2019 Somebody must have gone and done some really good hard work on that, uh, on that date. Oldest records in this grid cell actually made in 1957, but all of them have been refreshed. So there are no 1957 dates um, in that uh, table there of last recorded dates. So if we take all the grid cells in a region of interest, and we calculate the up-to-dateness of each grid cell in this way. And then we find the median of these dates. So we sort them and find the date in the middle. That is a measure of the up-to-dateness of, um, of the data area as a whole. So, um, so if we look at uh, South Africa, Lesotho, Eswatini, that date is um, the 9th of March, 2017, four and a bit years ago. So we can say that the up-to-dateness of Odonata map now is about four years and we ask the question is that bad or good and the answer is it's um, amazing, it's fabulous, in fact awesome. <clears throat> so we can look at the, uh, at the trend in the up-to-dateness, so this is why I'm so impressed by, this, um, by these numbers. So we weren't actually focusing on up-to-dateness. It was just, uh, this is just um, a byproduct of what we were doing. So at the end of every year, we can, we can calculate it, this up-to-dateness. So I pretended that I was um, on the 1st of July last year and, um, and calculated, if I'd calculated the up-to-dateness then, it would also have been four years and three months. And if I'd done it a year earlier, three years and nine months. So we've slipped by, um, 
by six months in up to dateness. And um, and and the pandemic has a um, has a big role to play in um, in that because we lost the end of um, of last season. So uh, in spite of everything, the uh, up to dateness has not slipped a great deal. In spite of the fact that we haven't actually um, focused on this uh, on this concept, and gosh, this up to dateness is a tough cookie to uh, to crack. And as your coverage expands, it gets harder and harder to keep the database up to date. But this is a critical concept of, of refreshing the records, um, which, um, which we need to, to bear in mind um, to that we are actually producing up-to-date maps, not antique maps. So the question is, what should you do in um, the upcoming summer? And it's, summer seems unbelievably far away with the snow on the mountains around here. Um, well, you can just keep going as you are at, um, at present. But if you'd like to do some uh, targeted atlasing, choose a grid cell that is, um, that is not up to date and look at the, um, at the top date of the uh, pair of dates and you'll see um, the uh, up to dateness of that grid cell. And you can um, choose your grid cell by um, by one which is um, you know out of, of the ones that are accessible to you that are uh, far out of date and you can look at the last dates recorded for the species and um, and you can search especially for the species which have a, um, a last recorded date which is far into the past <clears throat> we also have uh, maps like um, like this which um, I will put onto the um, BDR website as a blog in the next few days. The chorus produces these uh, maps for us and they are amazing. So those are the quarter degree grid cells and the, um, and the number in each grid cell is the total number of species to date. If you see a naught, it means that there is or there are records for that grid cell, but it hasn't been possible to identify them to, um, to species. And then along with that goes um, this map, which I think is, um, is suitably uh, motivating. This is the, um, the number of species per grid cell that we've uh, recorded just in the past year. And you can see that's a, rem a remarkable uh, a, a number of, uh, of records that we've got. So that's the Western Cape. Here's Mpumalanga um, and Gauteng, um, the total number of species per grid cell. And here is the, uh, what we've achieved in the past uh, year. Here's KwaZulu Natal, which has a pretty amazing uh, coverage. The um, grid cell up on the northeast, kind of four or five from the northern end which is undone as a grid cell which is essentially um, inaccessible by, uh, by road and here's what's been achieved in the past year so if we can actually keep maps like this going and up to date then uh, we can really motivate um, ourselves to uh, where the gaps are <clears throat> this is the um, coverage map for uh, kenya of the um, of the website and um, you can see um, north east of Kenya for dragonflies as it is for birds is uh, the coverage is poor and there are good uh, political reasons for that. Here's uh, Nigeria coverage for, um, for dragonflies. I asked the uh, members of the expert panel to um, make a few suggestions of things which I could uh, present this evening. And there were quite a few suggestions, in fact, enough suggestions that we can actually get the expert panel to do a, uh, a presentation sometime. Here's one species, banded skimmer, for which there are the um, green squares, eight records up to the end of December um, 2018. 
12 records subsequently. And, um, and that's a remarkable um, range, um, range expansion, which, um, which has to be genuine, because people were looking in all those places um, before um, 2019. And this is um, another species that's um, expanded its, its uh, range over a past uh, decade or so. Um, 48 records up to, um, up to 2010. And there's, there's, there's uh, really quite good coverage because the, um, uh, the previous JRS project to ours, the one by um, KD and um, Michael Samways, assembled all the, um, the museum data. So the museum data uh, is in fact uh, included in this, um, in this, um, these maps. So um, 48 records up to the end of 2009 and um, 227 records subsequently. So um, this, this has to uh, be some sort of validation of the, uh, the, the impact of this project in actually increasing our knowledge and keeping going um, on, in time is important too. I just want to talk a little bit about um, progress with our um, JRS Biodiversity Foundation project. So the JRS Biodiversity Foundation is, is not primarily concerned with um, collecting data they basically say lots and lots of organizations um, help with data collection. Their niche is, um, is actually getting data from the database into the, um, the brains and thinking of policymakers and other people who will use the data to actually improve biodiversity conservation. And, uh, and gosh, this is not easy to achieve. Um, things like, um, the, uh, the red data book for birds or the important bird areas, they've had real influence. But to, to get um, other taxa into the, um, the sort of the, the decision making domain is, is, not, uh, is not easy. And um, the um, Freshwater Research Center has helped us, helped us enormously to achieve this. So the, um, the, in the past year, the um, Odonato map data has been uploaded into the freshwater biodiversity information system and there's the uh, the website and um, you have to register on the fbis website and that's largely so that um, the freshwater research center can report to the jrs who is uh, is using the um, the database and the answer is, is that uh, it's impressive how this uh, database is being used. So that's, that for me has been the most amazing um, advance of the past year. Is actually, uh, this is our, um, our tool um, through the Freshwater Research Center of actually getting the dragonfly data into the, um, the, into the, into the domain of the decision makers. But independent of that, we have uh, three outputs to make, uh, an atlas, um, some documentation of the phenology of dragonflies, and a, um, a vital Odonata areas um, um, set of um, localities. So the, uh, the online atlas and the phenology is available through the, uh, the FBIS um, website. Um, but it's, uh, there are other ways of, of getting at it. It's quite hard to get to it through the, um, the BDI uh, website, written as, um, as blog posts, and it's a real mission to actually find the text for an individual species. So there are easier ways of, um, of getting there. So um, <clears throat> if you Google red veined dropwing, then um, or any other name of a dragonfly from South Africa, scientific name or um, common name, almost certainly it will be uh, near the top of 
the uh, Google search. Or you can just put the um, Red Vein Dropwing BDI. You'll get there fast. So, um, so that's a, a quick way of getting to the, um, the online Atlas text. There's another um, way of, um, of doing it, which is being implemented by Rene at the moment. So if you uh, go into the virtual museum and um, you look at the expanded page for the record, so not in the, the short form in the bottom left-hand corner, but in the, the, uh, the, the, the expanded page, then next to the species name, it says species text external link, and that takes you to the, um, to the Atlas, um, Atlas page um, in the BDI blog. So these are not all implemented yet, but Rene will get them up in the next uh, few days. <clears throat> so when you go to the, um, the um, actual Atlas, you see um, um, a website which looks something like this. This is Smoky uh, Spreadwing. Um, there are these, um, these maps which are kind of just graphics outputs are not proper maps as yet. So the, um, the, the, these maps are, a, uh, are an algorithm uh, developed um, which, which are purely uh, interpolation based. They impute in the gaps and the, uh, the map on the top left shows where the, um, the imputing, the guesswork is reliable and where it's uh, unreliable in the um, yellow orange um, areas. So you can take the distributions there with a, um, a pinch of salt, if you like. And on the right hand side, it shows the um, where the algorithm, where the algorithm thinks you are at the core or the edge of the range. And of course, the better the database is, the less interpolation has to be done, and the better quality these, um, these maps are. So I talked some time back about how um, we were doing these maps. And at the bottom two maps show the, um, the phonology of the uh, smoky sp spread wing. So the, um, each dot is the uh, number of records for a five-day period, um, what, um, what is known in the ornithological migration literature as a pentade, a five-day period, and the, uh, the blue line is just um, smoother to guide the, uh, the eye through the, um, um, through the, the dots. So, um, so the, um, these phonology plots are actually done without any protocol. So there's nothing which uh, you know, suggests people have to do data according to any pattern. This is just what comes. And um, it seems to um, merge with, um, with experience uh, pretty well. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side at the bottom are these um, um, images that uh, Ryan Tippett has come up with. There's, um, there's the identification uh, features for the, um, for the species and, um, and a, a habitat uh, photo, or habitat photos for the, um, for the species. So uh, this is the um, phonology plot again, 275 records for the species. And the blue line is, is a an artifact which is, is designed to guide the eye through the points and, um, and the phonology plot whether you just look at the points or whether you look at the line it's clear that uh, December January is the um, is the primary uh, flight period it looks as if you can find the species at any time of the year but that you're least likely to find it in uh, in, in August and the reason why the JRS was so keen that we should do these phonology plots is that with um, climate change, it's uh, one of the things that's expected to um, have to adjust is, um, is the phonology, the flight periods. 
and these plots will, um, will provide some sort of baseline against which um, future change can be um, can be measured. So, how to do these phonology plots better? The uh, the algorithm is very data hungry. It needs lots and lots of data. So, with the distribution maps, it's okay to get a couple of data points per year. With the phonology plots, there's a, um, a guideline which says submit a record for the same place um, after five days have uh, have elapsed. So that's a guideline. It's um, it's not a um, a rule by any manner of means. Not like uh, you know school rules, that sort of thing. So. Um, so the, the guidelines basically say, and this goes beyond phonology, if you have an interesting record to submit several from the same species, same space, same place, same day, then just uh, submit them. The, um, the algorithms which are used for the interpolation and for the phonology plots are uh, robust enough that you're not going to mess, uh, mess them up, having lots of data from the, uh, the same day even. Um, in the original database, the um, database from the um, previous JRS project, there's lots of specimen records and um, museum people very often collected 10 or 12 records from the same place on the same day. So the software has been designed to uh, cope with that. So if you're in different parts of the grid cell on the same day and you get the same species, do submit it. And, um, where uh, different means you're in a new habitat, you're at a, uh, a different altitude, you've moved a few kilometers since the last record, um, please err on the side of submitting rather than not submitting. So the next edition of the online atlas will have um, very much better maps than the dot maps that are, are currently uh, in use. So this is a test map for the um, orange wing drop wing. You might change the, uh, the colors to something which are more, um, more sensible than these. But the, uh, the, the point is that the darkest area is what the algorithm thinks is the core of the range. This is where the uh, species really wants to be. And, um, and if you're in suitable habitat, it's, um, it's likely to be found. And if you compare this with the actual distribution of orange wing drop wing, um, we have quite thinly scattered records across uh, Peru. And once again, I make the point, the more actual records we get, the less uh, interpolation we uh, need to do. So I want to make the next um, set of uh, maps um, early in, uh, in August. So if you have a backlog of records to um, submit, dragonfly records, damselfly records, please um, submit them in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> so we were also asked to produce what, um, what have been called vital odonata areas. So these are the key places where, um, where uh, dragonfly and damselfly conservation needs to be done. So we, we're usually these sorts of exercises are done by uh, putting bunch of people in a room and the person who shouts the loudest tends to win the day. So this is an attempt to do it first stage purely by, um, by algorithm, let the computer decide. So the, um, the algorithm makes use of the interpolated maps from the online atlas and um, the interpolated maps basically have uh, lots of false positives places where the species has been pushed into an area um, where it doesn't necessarily uh, occur. And then the algorithm I've developed gives each species uh, the same weight. And, um, and that weight is, is related to the um, its total range. So um, a species with a large range has a tiny weight in each grid cell. And um, it's the total range of the species. So if your species just creeps into South Africa, the city of Swaziland, it will only have a tiny weight and it won't influence the, uh, the choice 
of vital odonata areas. So then we add up the weights for all the species in the grid cell, and those with a high weight are then candidate species uh, for the um, vital odonata areas. Many of them could just be rejected out of hand because of the uh, interpolation issues into uh, grid cells which don't have any wetlands, but we can consider them all and, um, and then uh, think about them. So this is a um, set of, um, of um, candidate vital odonata areas. And um, over the next couple of months, we will be um, producing a, a list of these. Um, we'll look at them, get the experts to consider them. A lot of them are just going to be uh, tossed out because they don't have any, any wetlands. But it's an objective way of uh, searching everywhere. So many of these grid cells actually have uh, very, very few records. But if it's a, a mountainous region with few records, and we can see that there's habitat, then we're going to need to try and do some uh, ground truthing in those places um, over this coming summer. <clears throat> so there's one slide here on improving the value of records as you upload them and one of the um, one of the one of the things that we are aware of more and more is that um, if the background is useful don't crop the photos too tightly so if it's just you know it's a, just blue sky as a background well then it doesn't matter how tightly you crop the photos so if the background you think might be useful in terms of telling us something about the, um, um, the habitat the species was in, then, uh, then, then, then uh, you know, leave a fair amount of background in your photo. And you, in the virtual museum, you, you are allowed up to uh, three photos per species. And, and if it's feasible to um, add a, um, a habitat photo like this one of uh, Ryan's, um, please uh, add the, the species. So my prediction is that uh, if in 50 years time, it is the, the backgrounds and the habitats which are going to fascinate scientists the most as uh, global change takes uh, hold. And we, uh, we might lose some of the things. So, these photographic records have uh, have an enormous value um, over site records and even museum specimens, which just take the um, species right out of the, its, its context. So this is the uh, the edge that the uh, virtual museum has actually the opportunity to display habitats. And I really want to encourage people to um, to take the time to put habitat photos in as uh, as well. So finally, I, um, I need to express the, everybody's appreciation to what the, uh, the members of the expert panel do for the project. The IDs for Odin Automap, generally speaking, get done very, very fast. And it's just the really difficult records that uh, don't get done. And, um, and, and, um, and if, a, if a record can't be identified to species, then it just gets identified to uh, to genus, and we have to just have to accept that it's just not enough in the picture to actually make that, uh, that final final decision. The entire team that collects the um, the, the data, um, I think they've been amazing. That uh, they've actually kept the, um, the database up to date without even um, us us um, promoting up-to-dateness as a thing. Um, also expects our appreciation to the, uh, the JRS. They've not only uh, supported us, the part of the project which is making the data relevant, but they have challenged us and, um, and challenging us to get the data out of the computer into the minds of the decision makers has been really uh, difficult. And um, it's a challenge all around for all, um, all projects uh, that collect biodiversity data. Um, Helen Dallas and the team at the Freshwater Research uh, Centre 
and uh, we'll put Helen Dallas's presentation about F this um, into the um, uh, the email about uh, with with this presentation. Was that describes how the um, the process actually works. And and finally, when summer comes round, I'm hoping that we can make it a a really spectacular year in terms of um, of data collection and, uh, and a, a further set of maps for the um, for the atlas because this is not the the last word that we're doing we're doing it online so that we can keep it up to date so thanks very much thanks for your attention i appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk about this project thank you thank you very much les uh as a as a keen supporter of own and map um it's fascinating to uh, to receive a, a, an update like this hot off the press. And uh, I think as Julio said, it's, it's always good to, wonderful to see how you, uh, how you package the data and, and the information that's, that, that's in a project like this and make us really excited about uh, what can be done with, uh, with the data. Um, so I think uh, all of us, I think, really appreciate uh, your inputs into this process and um, making it uh, making it really sexy going forward. <laughs> um, so thank you very very much for that uh, for your presentation. Um, I think Odin Auto Map is, is is one of the success stories, uh, one of a number of success stories of the Virtue Museum uh, suite of projects. So uh, uh, it's really great that um, there's 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 the quality of data and quantity of data that allows uh, this kind of work to be done on it. Um, and so that we can see the outputs of this, uh, of this citizen science project, this important citizen science project. And of course, uh, you can upload your photos and your habitat photos. I think that is a very good suggestion. Um, we need to do that. I think for, for a lot of our uh, VM projects, virtual museum projects, because as you say, those habitat shots uh, will become more and more important as time goes on. I put a question Please. on. I put a question on. Not realising it was only. I put it just purely as a one for Les, but I wanted to put it into everybody. This whole thing about individual longevity. <clears throat> I've had like four specimens of uh, Phaon, uh, Phaon iridipennis, the uh, glistening uh, demersal, in, in my in the same place in my garden. There's a very shady little spot along the fence in the forest, and these these four individuals have been around since about March. And they show no sign of moving. They're just always there. Um, I don't know how long they live for, uh, but if you know, if, if I go and, and record them every month or every week, um, then they have chances are it's the same same record of the same individual each time. It's just uh, um, it's just a what's the word? It's it's it's, it's a it's a temporal thing rather than um, each one being a new record. Um, and I know. Uh, Odinata are quite long-lived creatures compared to, I think, compared certainly to a lot of butterflies. Um, but it's a question of, uh, of how do we know if we're photographing the same individual many times um, or um, if we're actually getting a, a genuinely new record. Yeah, I think from the, um, from the immediate project perspective, what we're trying to do, um, it's, it doesn't matter if you're actually photographing the same individual over and over again. Um, that's not going to um, throw out the, um, the phonology plots at all. It's, it's not totally 100% desirable, but it's just a fact of life. And the methods are robust enough. It's not going to be a big uh, problem. If we're going to actually uh, capture and mark um, these things, I'm sure we need um, permits to do that. We can't just do it off our own bat. But I think um, it's not beyond the possibility that we, because dragonflies are actually so well patterned that, um, that they'll, they'll, we could actually recognize um, individuals from species, mm. individuals from photographs, like you can recognize um, penguins or leopards. So, uh, so that's something which I think is an idea which is worth uh, worth pursuing. 
the great byproduct of the presentation. Mm. Yeah, I think some it might be a challenge with some, particularly some male uh, odonata, which yeah. do change uh, yeah. patterns and colours as they age, um, and as they get older, they get more more difficult to uh, you know to actually see some of those markings. Yeah. Um, mm. But yes, I think it. You know, one of the wonderful outputs outcomes of of these fantastic evening sessions is that. Uh, things are discussed that you know that uh, perhaps could materialize into into new ways of looking at things in future as well so um, i think that's um that's that's a, a wonderful spin-off of uh, of these discussions